Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we are just waiting for everyone in our other groups and from Google Classroom and WhatsApp to join. Meanwhile, you can write your research questions and I'm going to address them one by one. All of you, can you hear me? Is the voice clear? Thank you, Sarah. It's a very good question. ResearchGate is basically your Facebook for academics. So what happens is that, that you create an account on ResearchGate and through ResearchGate, you can not only search different research papers that you might not find in Google Scholar, if you do not have access to different databases like Scopus and PubMed and EBSCO. So what happens is that you can send a message to the author of the paper if you find him or her on the research gate. And then you can ask them to actually send you the paper. I can show you the screen for the research gate and the interface, how it looks like, so that you have a better idea um, how it works. So this is how the research gate interface looks like. I've opened my own account on research gate. Uh, mainly you can sign up with your own email address um, but I have heard complaints from different people that they have not been able to sign up on ResearchGate and they need an institutional email address so for example if you're studying in uh, different universities um, you have to have an email address that a university has made for you for example, if you're studying in LUMS, so it has to be a LUMS.edu.pk domain address for you to sign up. So how you do it is you go to the ResearchGet main page. And from there on, you can, you know, can actually log out for you, I can show you. So let me ask, uh, answer one more question that you asked. Um, on ResearchGate, you publish all your research. So these are my papers or preprints that I'm currently working on with different people. So you can add your research raw data. You can add your incomplete 
proposals or preprints. Preprints are the version of your research paper that have not been published or accepted in any journal at any point. So you can get feedback from other peers around the world on your manuscript if you upload that as a preprint. And you can also add other researchers on your ResearchGate profile if you if they're there. So this is one paper that I'm working with um, from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Professor Dr. John Johnson. And this is another translated version of um, a scale that I translated for different researchers. So you can add your research papers and your um, documents here, and you can also create different projects here. So you can not only add papers, you can also search for other papers. For example, um, if you go on the front page, you're going to see that on the right side, there are different researchers that are following me. And on the left side, you also see the people that I am following. And for example, if you're searching for a paper, you can search, uh, for example, let's say academic achievement. So a preprint is the incomplete version of your research paper. So that is a draft version that you upload on ResearchGate so that other professors around the world can give you feedback on your research. Yes, Sarah, this is exactly like LinkedIn. Um, it is a very good tool for connecting with professors around the world that are working in your field. Um, for example, this is the academic achievement uh, search that I have just did. Let me add other people who are waiting to join the live stream. Okay, so if you have um, a research uh, publication that you want to search, but you cannot find open version, you can go to publications and see what other people are publishing in this domain. So now we know that you know there is a article published, Academic Achievement and Breakfast Skipping. That's by Baby Nayak, Yadosh Satish, and Pratiti Haldar. So what you can do is, uh, this is a very good example for preprints. So this is an article that has not yet been published. So you can request the full text from the author. So you can either do it from here, or you can go ahead and open the paper. Rabbi, I'm almost done. Uh, with um, Sarah's question, I will get back to your question in a moment. So now you see this is the abstract of the paper. And you go down and you request full text. So when you're going to press the button, it's going to send a message. I can actually show you. I don't want to send you full text, um, send the author's request, but I can show you. So when you press the button, so you have already requested the full text and there will be a message i'm interested in this research could you provide the full text for it and you can press send when you do that researchers are very kind around the world so they do send you the response by sending you the paper and you can download it from within the research gate so that's um, how the academic community uh, works All right, as for your question, um, Rabia. No, I have to actually read your manuscript before I can comment on that. But generally what happened is that when you're using the mediation and moderating variables in a regression analysis, you basically have to make sure that all your 
observations and measurements have been properly coded in dichotomous variables, in continuous variables, and you have to label them. For example, if you have male or female marked as one and two, you need to make sure that the labels have been set for that. So if you're doing analysis in SPSS, or um, you have to make sure that you prepare the data for the analysis in Excel before you import that to SPSS. So you have to label one as male and two as females. Because when you're going to run analysis, it's going to show you different moderating groups. Now, what happens with mediation and moderating analysis is that um, both of them are basically multiple regressions. So if you have more than two variables, these these fall under the category of multivariate analysis where you're trying to find out the relationships or association between these variables and between these variables you have to find out how much the dependent variable has been caused by certain independent variables so what is the percentage of variation and when you use a moderating analysis what you do is that you use a certain group that moderates the interaction between the independent variable and the dependent variable kumera uh, umar just give me a minute you know let me uh, respond to your question uh, let me finish with uh, rabia's question first so what happened is that um, I would like to also send you, uh, actually I can show you here, the book that I would like you to consider for that. It's a very intuitive book, um, almost in all US universities. Uh, this is the standard undergraduate book for multivariate analysis. Um, the book is by Rebecca Warner. And this is one of the best books that I recommend to my students. It's called Applied Statistics from bivariate through multivariate techniques. Um, and Rebecca has taken all the possible analysis that you can think of in SPSS, at least the most used one and the more frequent ones. And she has um, explained it in a manner which is very, very easy for people to understand numbers because statistics can be very daunting concept for a lot of people. And to visualize the data or visualize the problem, you have to think of it in a very creative and visual way. So what she does is that, you know, she starts off with a chapter of review of basic concepts. And then she goes ahead and talks about sampling error and confidence intervals and things like that. And then from bivariate uh, analysis, um, she goes to regression and then exploratory analysis, which is also the uh, factor analysis, which finds out the general pattern or theory development aspect of your data. And then it gets into uh, mediation and moderation also. So I would like to recommend you to actually use this book and read um, about the moderation that you're trying to use, because that's something that you're going to be um, using the most um, in your analysis. Um, so make sure that your concepts are clear, your data is uh, properly labeled and valued, you have the right category for the data, and then you finally run the analysis on that and then report that. Uh, for people who don't know, we are organizing a workshop uh, on how to actually write your results and your literature review uh, in a research paper in an APA format. We are um, organizing this workshop next weekend. It starts from Saturday. It's a weekend workshop. So it's Saturday, Sunday, 6th of June and 7th of June. Um, you can sign up for that um, either to um, signing up on our Facebook event or you can go to our website, which I can share with you also. Um, and you can sign up here. And there are details of our workshop on the website also and you can sign up here um, and uh, we're going to be adding you to our whatsapp group and the google classroom where we have most of our materials now um, having said that 
if you still have any questions uh, and any of the participants um, joining, if you still have any questions, let me know and I would be more than happy to help you both with your research formulation, your data collection, your research analysis, what it might mean. And if there's anything that I can possibly do for you, I will do it. I hope this um, answers your question. So Kumara, you asked the question, what are the prerequisites to choose a research topic for your doctoral dissertation? Now, this is a very frequently asked question. Um, many of my students, you know, ask this question the first time um, they interact with me. And I tell them the most important thing that you should always keep in mind as a scientist in training, as someone who's going to become very adept at what they're doing. Always, always choose a research topic that you're passionate about. Never ever choose a research topic because your colleagues, your friends, your circle or environmental trends suggest. Always do what makes you happy because research is a very complicated and very tiresome process. You can go online and search for PhD stress and depression and anxiety. I personally know a lot of friend of friends of mine who have gone through a miserable period of life in pursuit of trying to figure out their PhD. But the problem is that if you're really passionate about some topic, you would definitely need to be very excited about that. You want to really make a difference. You want to solve a real life problem. So, you know, success is something that is very partial. I mean, whatever the result of your research, it's significant or not, at least you have done something and you're happy about that. You have a question in your mind and you want to solve that. And once you're able to do that, you will have this great personal satisfaction, which is priceless. If you do your research based on someone else, that is going to be not only tiring for you, but also it's going to be very frustrating for your supervisor. So first of all, choose your topic based on what you want to do. Um, I also have a personality test and that um, I have designed in cooperation with University of Pennsylvania. So you can go to my uh, website and you can press big five personality test. It's one of the most scientifically validated personality tests that we know of. And the research is very clear on that. We have numerous um, journal articles and papers on that. Um, you can take this test and um, you have to ask multiple choice questions and find out what, what your gift is. Everyone comes with a gift and human beings are different from each other, mostly in five big domains. We call them openness to experience conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion, and neuroticism. So you can read more about that on here and find out what your personality type is. And then also think, do some soul searching and find out what makes you happy. What are the most challenging questions in your life? And then take that and do something about that. And if you need any help, you know, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, Sarah, to briefly answer your question, if author sends you his paper himself, that is not stolen or uh, plagiarized. You can always use that paper. And also there is a website called SciHub where you can use, uh, you can download research papers for free. Uh, so for some, they might think it's a piracy, but you know, it's, it's very, um, it, it's, it's used very frequently. So um, I would suggest if you do not have access to a research database through your library, please use that. Um, Sarah, if you publish your preprint in the um, research gate, it's used with your name and someone cannot actually take it and publish it because that would be plagiarism on their part and they can be permanently banned from a journal or research publication if um, the, it's found out that you know this research is stolen. Yes, Sarah, uh, these, these same rules apply for preprints as for research papers.
You know, I had some questions from, I think it was Sumera who sent me the question. Uh, actually, it was Sana who actually sent me the uh, request to review her uh, NVivo projects. So if you're here, I can um, address your data also. Um, Sarah, it's very easy to find out if the journal is indexed or not because when you open a journal website, um, they give you details on where they are indexed and where they're published. So, for example, if you could open a famous journal called Journal of Social and Personality Psychology. So let me actually show you how it um, looks like and how can you find the relevant information as an author to take care of and use uh, submit um, a, a proposal for your research paper. So this is um, the front page of Journal of Social Psychology. You can also read the sample articles here, what, um, how they're published, their impact factor, and um, how often is it published? Is it monthly or is it bi-monthly or is it annual? So that's something that you could do. Um, you can also see the editor spotlight, their interviews, and a lot of other information. Now, when you go back, I'm um, sorry, you scroll down, you find out the manuscript submission details. So now you see that there are guidelines on how to publish and what are the rules for that. So if you look here at submissions, author must complete the open practices disclosure form. And then it's going to take you the disclosure form uh, part. And then there are other, there's all information that you can find about um, publishing research um, in on the page of the journal. So that's not something that you are going to be um, left out with so you see that there's a huge amount of information that you have to think uh, about before you actually uh, do the submission so it's a very lengthy and it's a very daunting process but you still have to um, you know have some patience and uh, take things um, in a stride and take things one by one and complete them and then you know uh, you can submit your manuscript for the review um, so if you look at here, it tells you about your word limits, how uh, long your paper should be, the abstract and keyword rules, referencing re re uh, rules, tables, figures, display equations. So there are so many things that you have to only read the description to understand. And you know, this varies from different journals to different journals. Uh, this is only specific to our Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. It's a very reputed journal in psychology. So that's um, something um, that you can always find. And it also tells you about the indexing, where the journal is indexed. Most of the time, the uh, top-rated journals um, are actually indexed everywhere, in Scopus or in Google and everywhere else. So that's not something that you have to worry about. So this is the abstract and indexing services information that you can find. So you, as you can see, this journal is index in academic search elite academic search index business brochures ebsco medline proquest psych info and psych line scopus so there's all the journals that you can uh, all the databases that you can possibly think of you know it's there Uh, 
Um, so unfortunately, there are no shortcuts. Writing a research paper is a very um, hard ta task, especially when you're competing with everyone around the world. Um, you have to follow these um, instructions. But generally, um, you can find a template uh, of uh, research papers that um, are accepted in um, the journal. For example, if you go to the read sample articles, you can click there. And then there are different uh, papers that have been published uh, by this journal. So one shortcut could be that you know you open one of those articles and then format your paper according to that. And uh, you still have to make sure that uh, the formatting is exactly done um, like in the paper. So you don't have to reformat that and you do not get uh, rejection by authors I'm sorry, by reviewers based on your um, formatting. So this is how it looks like. Um, you see the abstract um, and it's two column uh, formatted file and then you know there are different sections and methods, uh, measures, tables, results, and uh, finally your, and there are different studies in this paper and finally you can go ahead and um, see the references. It's quite a long paper. But anyways, the point was that you understand that um, formatting should exactly be like as specified in the journal guidelines. Rabia um, it actually varies from article to article. Um, it depends on what kind of article are you writing? Is it for a conference or is it for a poster or is it for a journal submission or is it for your master's thesis or doctoral thesis? Um, it also depends on the field that you're studying in. For example, um, if you're studying in sociology, um, some of the times articles are to be submitted in Vancouver or Chicago or MLA um, citation style, which is different from the psychology discipline in which we use the APA. So that's something that you have to take care about. Um, now the journal principle are that you have to make sure that it's easy for people to read. So you have to divide it in sections. Um, as a boilerplate template, uh, you start with your introduction and then you do the literature review to find out what has already been researched in this field. And then you base your arguments on the research gap that you have found through your literature review. And then you take it and design a research methodology that you would use to answer research questions that you have found through your study of literature gap. And then um, you, when you've designed your research methodology, you collect your data. And then after you've collected your data, you have to make sure that you know um, it's the right data. You have to run different tests of normality and homogeneity of variance. Uh, if that's a quantitative um, research and it um, has the assumptions of homogeneity of variance and uh, normality. And then after that, you uh, run the analysis and then report the analysis. And then there's a limited space for um, discussion and research limitations. Uh, this is the general format of that. Um, sorry, do you mean um, how to work on your language, English language in a paper? That, that's what you mean? Um, yes, um, as you know that all of us almost are from um, non-native English speaking countries. So there are some tools that you could actually use for that. Um, and I've shared this in our WhatsApp group a um, couple of days ago. I think you've seen that also. One of the tools is called Grammarly. You could use this tool. I will not go into 
and details on how to use this tool um, because we're going to be doing that in depth um, on the weekend workshop but I can show you the website where you could actually use the free version of that I mean I recommend that you use the professional version but if you're using the free version um, it should also be enough to actually tell you about your basic grammatical mistakes and syntax mistakes for example the verb noun matching and the proper use of adjectives and punctuation and sen sentence construction now this is the interface for Grammarly the free one so you can add new and add your file that you want to proofread and it will do a good job for you but I would recommend that you uh, purchase a premium version uh, if you need premium version you can contact me also you know I have some business accounts um, that I can arrange for you other than that what you can do is you can use uh, built-in word tools uh, for spelling and grammar check um, that's another good option also um, and finally send your paper to someone who is a native speaker or someone who is far more seasoned with language than you and then uh, ask them to proofread your research paper for you so make sure that you know your research um, is not grammatically incoherent before you um, send it for the submission uh, Grammarly is um, actually very good when it comes to the premium version. Um, it has all the tools uh, that you would need, for example, the verbal fluency, the mood of your article, the tone of your article, the words. It actually suggests you to use different words also. So it's a very good tool if you have the premium version. Um, so I really suggest that you invest um, in that tool because that's going to help you a lot um, I've seen a lot of um, research papers getting rejected and students contacting contacting me that you know their research has been returned because of the language restrictions so I would really suggest that you make sure that you have proof read your research before you send it to your supervisor Sorry, you can contact me um, on WhatsApp and in private, and you know I can recommend uh, you uh, someone who would actually do it for you. Okay, if you're using a premium version, it should be fine. But if you still are not confident about the language and structure, and sometimes that does happen, you know, even if you have uh, make have made sure that you know your research has been proofread through Grammarly, um, you can still actually use the um, proofreading services uh, of someone who's the discipline-specific expert. Um, so you can send it to some of your professors or you can use an external proofreading service um, so you can um, use that if you want so do we have any other questions for those who are new, I uh, just wanted to remind you that um, we are organizing an academic writing workshop on uh, weekend from 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. 6 June. So you're most likely to, um, you're more than welcome to join uh, if you want to learn about writing academic papers um, searching for journals to submit and reading about their submission guidelines and other things. Now, sorry, uh, quartiles are basically the tiers of the quality of research uh, or, or of journals. Sorry. So, what you do is the best journals, best 25 journals, are ranked into quarter one, and the next 25 percent into quarter two, and then um, the third quarter and then the fourth quarter. 
So this is basically a division of journals in four categories, uh, one being the best and four uh, being the last. So that is something um, that, um, you know, good journal papers um, are generally submitted um, to quarter one and quarter two and journals. So that is something that uh, you might want to keep in mind when publishing your research. I've also shared the link for our Facebook event for academic writing and um, the timings for that. Um, it is actually uh, based on impact factor, but based on that such impact factors, um, it's also divided into four quartiles. So the 20, top 25% would be in quarter one um, in terms of impact factor also. So do we have any other questions? I mean, feel free to ask any question about your research uh, because I'd be more than happy to um, answer any of your questions uh, because these are the questions that people generally ask me almost every day. So if you do have this question, I mean, I'm giving this opportunity to actually ask your questions about your thesis, about your, about your final project, about submissions, about academic writing, all of the things that I have been uh, you're answering for quite some time now. Yes, all right, does, and it uses the same formula for ranking, quarter one, 25%, quarter two, 50%, and then so on and so forth. Okay, dot RIS and dot bib. They are two different kinds of file extensions that you can import into EndNote. Uh, so for example, if you're downloading a dot RIS file, um, you can import that in EndNote um, as a library um, or as a journal entry, and that would be added. So basically it's the research information system. Let me explain. Um, show you that it's RIS format is the research information system incorporated to enable citation programs to exchange data. So you can read more about that um, on the file extensions or Wikipedia, uh, and both of these can actually be imported into EndNote. Mm, I believe you were in the workshop in which I told you how to import the citations from Google Scholar and then add into EndNote, you simply download the file, and then you uh, open the file and it opens um, EndNote, and um, that's how you uh, import your citations from Google Scholar into the EndNote, and then you can subsequently add those citations into your uh, Word um, document or whatever editor that you're using uh, for um, writing your research paper. Uh, we still have some time left, so you're more than welcome to ask um, any questions. It could be generally about your research topic also. Um, it could be anything, you know. And the difference is that um, there are some databases that allow you to download files um, as .ris to so EndNote and uh, uh, 
dot bib is uh, if i'm not mistaken it's used by another software called bibtex and you can export it through bibtex and then um you know use that in your um research um i will also tell you uh, i'll also give you a brief introduction of um manually adding the citations through bibtex which is another uh, latex based uh, software that some people tend to use uh, so I'm not going to go into that at the moment, but in the workshop, um, I can briefly tell you uh, how to use um, that software also. Yes, sir, the, um, actually the purpose of both of these um, research, um, sorry, file extensions are to synchronize the information about journal, authors, publication date, um, URLs or whatever is part of your citation and then um, sort it and make it easy for the software to understand that what fields are appropriate. And once your software actually imports this information, it's, um, it uh, outputs the citation in the right format, be it APA or MLA or Vancouver or any style you simply have to import these files to your um, reference management software and it's going to take it from there so you don't have to worry about it too much you know it's not very important let's put it that way you know once you have imported your references um, that's the end of it Uh, sure, sir. I can show you that um, in the next uh, workshop. Raj, you're more uh, than welcome to ask any questions. If I knew about econometrics, which I know a little bit, I am um, going to address the questions. If I don't, I'll let you know. Sure, Sarah, if there is um, interest in latex, we can organize a workshop on that also. Um, Raj, you can go ahead and ask the question. What do you want me to show, Sarah? Okay. Now, um, Raj, I believe that you know, this question is out of my um, subject area. It um, has to do more with um, modeling of uh, economic um, error correction. And I've done a quick Google search and it 
um, seems like that um, it does calculate the um, error model that belongs to a category of multiple time series models uh, and that's most commonly used for data where the underlying variables have a long run um, stochastic trend as known as a co-integration um, so I won't be um, able to um, tell you exactly how it works but uh, my knowledge of econometrics um, if that's not flawed so what I understand is that you know it uses the economic indicators to predict the future trends um, like prices and inflation um, and um, demand and supply relationships and what we do that uh, when I teach courses in machine learning what happens is that you know you use uh, you estimate models based on an regression line to try to find the best best fit between the data points and the regression line and once you have a model that roughly explains the data that you have on hand which is the observed data then you predict the future best fit line and then in future when you your predicted data becomes the observed data you assimilate that information into your existing data and the algorithm learns from it so that's basically based on the multiple regression algorithm and then there's different complexities in that sometimes um, um, there are there the outcome variable is dichotomous like in logistical regression and sometimes um, it is categorical so there are different forms of regression that you can use for that I do not specifically know about the kind of uh, modeling that you're talking about I need to actually um, look at the data that um, you're talking about um, but I have a um, an educated guess uh, that you know the error prediction through machine learning um, basically gives you an opportunity to fit the data to the um, best fit line in a manner that that gives you the maximum likelihood of the data points to fit as closely possible to the best fit line um, as you can and you know this is the iterative process in which you would be using multiple iterations of the analysis to incorporate observed values as the predictions become the observed values and then you in continuously improve your model so that its predictive ability uh, improves so I think this is the best answer that I can give you at the moment without actually having to look at the data um, and the error correction models uh, uh, are generally more used in machine learning um, in com as compared to um, social sciences um, you know I, I buy, I'm by training um, uh, social scientists um, but I have worked with a lot of other um, hard sciences um, professionals and professors also so I do know um, the research methodology quite well um, but I not might I might not be able to actually and give you a very domain specific um, answer um, that you're looking for All right, Sarah, what is that that you want me to show you? Okay, yes, we can do that um, in the workshop. I mean, um, 
now might not be a, a good time for that but you know we talked about this trick the last time also in the workshop so basically what happens is that um, in vivo uses your computer date as the expiry date calculation method and um, if you still want to use it afterwards um, you could uh, in some instances go back to a certain calendar date um, or a year and then um, it should work seamlessly I mean it's working for me uh, I'm not sure about um, you or anyone else but um, I'd be more than happy to look into that um, after you have started the end vivo um, you can put your date back to its original updated date and your Firefox and everything will work Okay, Sarah, it seems like it's, you know, it's, it's your specific um, computer issue that we can, you know, discuss um, in private uh, or at another time. Uh, but, you know, I'll surely help you with that. that that's not a problem at all. Um, Raz, the easiest way to find out about a regression analysis is that um, you look at the R square values of your calculated model, and then you also look at the significant values, and that um, generally the traditional accepted value is 0 0.05. Um, and if it's significant, it's that going to show you in the output, uh, depending on what software package you're using to analyze your data, if that's SPSS, that's sure going to um, show you the coefficients and the significance level. Uh, and once it does show it to you, um, you can actually um, see if it's uh, if it fits uh, or not. And, and you know, I don't want to get into complex statistical uh, philosophical discussion here, but you know, uh, there are arguments about uh, what is an acceptable R square value, what is the best fit um, or overfit or underfit estimate uh, for the values. Um, that is something you know that's not that's beyond the scope of this Facebook Live. Um, but you know, I'd be more than happy if you can send me a, a message and you send me your data, and I'd be, have a look and see you know how it works uh, for your model. Now there are so many other things that you can do uh, f on on your research and uh, Rabia. Um, depends actually what you're looking for also and uh, what your supervisor wants because uh, there's so much insights uh, personally I believe that most insightful data in a research can be done in very small um, steps for example your descriptive research tells a lot about the demographics of your data and how prevalent the problem is so you can see your sample size and you can see their level of education and other socioeconomic factors, their gender, their age, their experiences, um, and the results of your questionnaire. Um, and then you can play with different variables to see if there's there are, there are, there is enough of a trend for you to notice and if that makes difference. So you have to do the chi-square test of independence to see if there is association or not. And then you can also um, do an analysis of variance between two variables you can see the correlations you can also see the covariances between different variables you can if you have a multi-level hierarchical modeling in your research uh, then you can also um, see the path coefficients between different variables uh, and then we have issues of uh, vif collinearity and things like this so there are hundreds of things that you can do with your research but um, never forget the fact, and this is probably the most uh, complicated problems for student is that you know they get lost into a lot of numbers and statistics, and they lose sight of their the bigger purpose, the main goal of their research. The main goal of your research is to answer the questions that you have chosen for yourself in the design phase. Just answer the your research question in the research. And then that's all your supervisor needs. That's all your paper needs to demonstrate. Um, because the possibilities are um, literally unlimited. So 
Sarah, there's uh, so many things that you can uh, do with the data. The, again, the question is, what is your ultimate goal? You know, you can use the forest plot, you can use the heat map. Uh, heat map basically tells you the um, values of a certain specific area in contrast with others. And so let's say if you're finding out the um, sales figures um, in US, which state is most profitable and which is the least profitable. So you can create a heat map to see um, and you can color code it uh, in a manner that shows you the brightest and strongest colors in the most uh, profitable states and the you know, more lighter and duller colors for the least profitable states. And that will be your heat map. Um, so that's something that you have to decide. And it all depends on your data. You know, if you're doing the qualitative research, you can create different nodes through NVivo. And for people who are new, who, who don't know that, you know, we have already or organized workshops on qualitative and data analysis using NVivo. Um, you can also go to my um, YouTube channel and then you can see all the uh, previous workshops that we have uh, conducted. Um, this is how you actually have to um, make sure that, you know, your qualitative data falls under, under a structure. Um, Rabbi, I think I've already answered your question about article writing. Um, I did tell you that it depends on your goals, but generally there is a structure. The structure is the introduction, literature review, um, research design, data collection, data analysis, and then reporting other results. That's your structure. All right, guys, this is over an hour now. Um, I think uh, we have uh, you know, taken a lot of questions uh, and I'm sure you know there are more questions than have been answered um, or more questions that have risen from my answers. But um, I think we have to end it here for today. We can uh, organize another session, a uh, Facebook Live session uh, some other day. If you still have any questions, you know, feel free to send me a message and uh, I would look into your data um, personally and guide you how you can proceed with your research um, or if there are any questions at all relating to academic writing um, and proofreading uh, or um, you know, using some of the softwares Grammarly, um, I would try to make sure that, you know, uh, you get the resources that you need for your doctoral work. Um, or your master's thesis. Um, Sarah, unfortunately, you have to close it here, but you can send me a message and uh, we can discuss it there. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. It's, it's been a pleasure uh, to have you here and see you so much interested in your um, research and doing work towards it. Um, I wish you best of luck for your research and let me know if I can help you in any way. Thank you so much and have a nice evening.